Hi, I'm Michal Richardson. Hi, I'm Liam Neeson. Welcome to The Graham Norton Show. And a special hello to our virtual studio audience. Hello, everyone. Hey! And may I be the first to wish you a happy coronaversary. Yes! I know. <laughs> hey, but hey, look, the roadmap out of lockdown starts soon. On Monday, we can meet up in groups of six again. So, good news, the Lib Dem conference is back <laughs> off. <laughs> hey! People can meet up outside again in a park. At the 12th of April, you can have a staycation. And, of course, on the 1st of May, it's outdoor sex and dogging. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh... <laughs> Mark it in your diary. Hey, Deborah. Uh, uh, now, uh, <laughs> who have we got on the show tonight? Uh, with me here in the studio, it's the man of a thousand voices, Rob Bryden! <laughs> the star of the good fight and the thrilling new drama, The Beast Must Die, it's Kush Jumbo! <laughs> She's the queen of Dragon's Den, back for its 18th hit series, it's Deborah Meaden! <laughs> we'll be joined down the line by French star of The Serpent and critically acclaimed The Mauritanian, that's Tahar Rahim! <laughs> and we'll be joined from New York by father and son duo Liam Neeson and Michal Richardson! Plus, right here in the studio, we will have music from the fabulous Laura Mvula! Love her! Woo! Live music! Live music! Yeah. yeah. We are the audience she's dreamt of for years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, welcome all of you. Old, old hands. Well, don't look disappointed. No, don't no, you? thrilled, thrilled. Experience, no, experience it's, guest. It's yeah. you again. <laughs> no, no, none of that. <laughs> and yet I'm drawn to my fresh faces <laughs> over here. Uh, Debbie Kushjumbo. Kushjumbo, I did not know this. Hmm. Kushjumbo, it's a biblical name. Yeah, Kush, Kush is... Uh, well, the Jumbo bit is my dad's name. He's Nigerian. But the Kush bit, it was an ancient Egyptian king. And king, it's in the Bible. King Kush. Kush is Ham's grandson. Ham is Noah's son. So I'm Noah's grandson, you know, with the Ark and the... Yeah. Wow! I know. It's a big name. I grew into it. It was a name <laughs> that I grew into. You know what I mean? And beware, everyone. This lady here is Deborah. Mm -hmm. Deborah and nothing else. And people get it wrong, don't they? Well, yeah, people who are actually asking me for my money get it wrong, which is pretty amazing, isn't it? Well, it is weird to come in and pet you go, all right, Debs. Debs. <laughs> 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 Let that be the only time you ever say oh, Debs. Uh, no, Deborah, Deborah, <laughs> Deborah, Deborah. And uh, so have you always been Rob? Were you ever a robber? Well, it's like Debbie was saying, oh, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it, Dad. It's just as well. It's just as well there's distance between oh, us. Um, <laughs> you, yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm christened Robert, so I was... But I've always been a, a Rob, really. Um, some friends, close friends, call me Bobby. Oh. Which I like because that's what Robert De Niro's friends call him. <laughs> uh. And it makes me feel like yet another similarity. Yes. Twins. <laughs> Twins. Just more bonding. Just more bonding. <laughs> uh, talking of bonding and links, here's a weird thing. Because uh, Trump obviously found huge success in America, but it, it sort of inspired... Well, not sort of, actually inspired by you, Rob Brighton. Well, I don't look so shocked. Bobby. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, yeah, I've, I've always written bits and pieces, um, but when I was writing Josephine and I, I was drawn back to something that I loved when it first came on called Marion and Jeff. Oh, yeah. Which I loved. If no one's ever seen it, it's incredible. It's basically just this guy who has been, you know, his wife's thrown him out and found somebody else, and he's just driving around bitterly in a... In a he's a taxi driver, right? Yes. In his, in his taxi on his own. But what's amazing about it is he never... You never see Marion, you never see the new boy Friend, but you can imagine everyone, and I always just thought it was one of the most amazing fit pieces of television ever, and it always made me want to write. So well, yeah, thank you. It was Jeff, of course, was 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 the guy that Marion was with. Keith was the was Keith was, was the, the driver. Boyfriend. You yeah. were Keith, yeah. I yeah, was yeah. Keith. What I mainly take, thank you, Kush. What I take from that mostly is what an old tart I've become. Because when <laughs> when, when Kush said how much she liked you, did you see what I did, Graham? I went. 
Thank you. <laughs> you did. <laughs> I, I did that classic old actor's thing. <laughs> Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. I couldn't believe I was doing it. <laughs> it is funny when you do those things as a joke and then suddenly, oh, now I'm oh, really doing it. it. <laughs> you, just, you, you become that person. But that's 20 years ago, Marion and Jeff. I know, it? I was like 16. Yeah, all right. Okay, moving on. And <laughs> 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 then why bring a Jeff? Timeless. It's a fabulous job. Uh, listen, we start with Deborah Meaden back with the new series of Dragon's Den. It starts Thursday, the 1st of April at 8 o'clock on BBC One. Is this the first time it's been on BBC One? It is. In fact, we filmed it. It was on BBC Two. And then we, I woke up one morning and it became on BBC One. So, yeah. Oh, wow. I know. And it's, I say it's the 18th series, but how many series for you? When did you join? Uh, so, I joined series three. So, that... Series, but I'm not very good with numbers. <laughs> wow. <laughs> good, good, good to know. Hold on a minute. <laughs> series 15. <laughs> series 15. Yeah, sorry, my 15th series. Yeah. Uh, tell you what, let's have a taste of what to expect in the new series. The toughest third floor in town. My heart is literally pounding through my chest. Is open for business once again. I'm not going to let you fall into a trap of really winding me up. The five straight-talking titans of commerce... You're making diddly squash. These are not numbers that make an investable business. Are on the hunt for the next big money-making idea. And they're more than happy to fight it out. Tuka, I don't want your answers. Uh, I'm thinking, Deborah. Are you going to think for me? Hoping to impress the dragons... I will work so hard. I just need the opportunity. <sighs> ..is a new batch of nervous entrepreneurs. I've rehearsed this about a million times. I'm so sorry. And it's not for the faint-hearted. Sorry. Ooh. There's a clock in that, Deborah. You do think, when those lift doors open, there must be times you just go, oh, sweet Jesus, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> I can't possibly say. Um, yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But do you know something I have definitely learned in 15 series? You d I don't care what you... You always have first impressions, but I have definitely learned to wait, because I've watched people come in through the doors and think, oh, come on, you've got to be kidding. And I've ended up investing in them, you know, so I yeah. have definitely learned to, uh, to, you know, hold on for a moment. And obviously it's edited for, for telly. How long do those pictures go on? Well, some of them... The longest I've ever been is three and a half hours. <gasps> and that, yeah... So it, Was that when, good or bad? When, when, no, it's good. So the longer it goes, the more likely, the more interested we are. You okay. know, it, so the shortest is 11 minutes. That didn't go so well. <laughs> um, for three and a half hours. Um, but actually... It, when they edit it and I watch it, I think we could probably have done it in ten minutes because you know they actually do get the real essence of what went on in yeah, the yeah. on in the actual pitch. Presumably, you know, meeting the people on the show is one thing, but there must be lots of people who can't be bothered to apply who then just see you and go, Debbie Meaden, listen to my idea. Uh, that happens quite a lot. That does happen quite a lot. Actually, COVID's been quite a nice break from that. You know, I've actually been... <laughs> I haven't been on the streets, but, no, that does happen a lot. And, and it's in the... You know, I, I can remember once I was, I was at a railway station about to get on the train to Paddington, trains turning up in ten minutes, lady behind the screen says to me, I'm so glad I've seen you. My son's got a brilliant idea, oh and I'm gosh. thinking, we're OK, cos I've got to buy a ticket and I've got to get on the train, so it can't be long. So we're chatting for about five minutes. You can imagine agitation behind me. There's about 30 people queuing up. And I said, um, I'm, on, I'm on the Paddington train, is there? And she said, oh, don't worry, dear, it's 20 minutes late. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I wasn't popular. Now I am worried. Yes, I was worried. Um, and the things that pitch, I mean... I, I, well, that's why I'm not an entrepreneur, because it's very hard to tell the difference between a good one and a bad one. Mm. You described this as a bad one. This is uh, fake nails for cats. <laughs> you, you, think that's a good, you think that's a good one, don't you? Well, I mean, I don't know why it's worse than, than something else. Have you got a cat? Two. OK. Would you buy would those? Would your no. cat... Would, no. no, more to the point, what would your cat do if you were tempted to put turquoise false fingernails You on? wouldn't even have to try to put them on, my cats. They would look at those, and the look in their little catty face <laughs> would tell you it's not happening. There no. you go, I rest my case. But are those little nail guards, or are they if, you're if your cat lost a nail? Well, uh, well, obviously, if your cat lost a nail, obviously, if they're going out and, they, you know, <laughs> they need to gels or whatever... No, no, yeah. actually, it's not as... It's, so the idea was right. The idea was... You know cats scratch stuff? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so the idea was to stop cats scratching. So they want to look good while they're doing that. Well, totally. <laughs> very important. <laughs> but then, so this is a bad idea, but Deborah invested in this dog ice cream. 
Now, why is that a good idea? Because I do have a dog, and no, I'm not buying that. Well, do you give your dog ice cream? No. Well, good, because <laughs> ice cream's actually bad for dogs. But these are nutritious iced treats. And I tell you why it's a good idea, because we sold that, and it's doing really well. It's now a multinational business. Wow. That's why it's a good idea. You have a dog. I do. Yes, I would get that for Henry. Would you? I'm that mar That's my market. Like, I'm that market. I'm your market. So I would see that and be like, oh, ice treats nutritious for Henry. Yeah, I'm always looking for ways to make his life more exciting. What, what flavours are they? Uh, mango and apple. Oh, and... Those are no, no, they're really good. Very... Then we did popcorn. So we did ice cream and then we ice treats and then we did the popcorn. You do the popcorn. Oh, there's, you would. there's popcorn. You see, I told you, there we are. <laughs> yeah. I must say, Graham, I'm, I'm just relieved when you, when you first showed it, I thought it was ice cream flavoured with dog. You know, it was, <laughs> it was, it was, I, I was that close to walking. <laughs> yes, I can't believe you did that, Deborah. Because, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Rob Brighton, of course, you've been on the other side, the opposite side of Dragon's Den. You've been taking products and selling them to the consumer, because it's not a good ad unless there's a Rob Brydon voiceover, because you are brilliant at them. I still, I still do, I've done a lot over the years. I mean, if you'd like a, a few. Oh, go, 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 go. Uh, well, for example, uh, Gaviscon Cool, what a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Auntie, taste the exotic. <laughs> Philadelphia with chives. <gasps> Sainsbury's, try something different. I'm hungry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Toilet duck goes on cleaning, oh. flush after flush. Oh, that one. <laughs> the Sunday yeah. Times is the Sunday Papers. It's good, because you don't know it's Rob Brydon until oh, you yes. hear it's Rob Brydon. Brilliant. Yeah. Spec savers. Give it a try. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> I mean, anything. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I, I was the one for a while. I said, oh, you know when you've been tangoed. That was me for <gasps> many years. Oh, that was oh, you. That, oh, 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 I met my hero. He's here. <laughs> He's here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, did you get into any, any trouble when all the kids started slapping each other in the face? <sighs> I wouldn't have cared. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the voice, <laughs> not my hand. <laughs> so do you still occasionally get checks when they do those adverts of the 1990s? Because the, ta the tango one must come up as a classic. Yeah, you get, yeah, you get, I think all actors yeah. get the odd little dribble, literally three pence for a Miss Marple. We, we, I've all actually, <laughs> I, I'm in a Miss Marple, I'm in a few of those things. And, and it's quite funny to be 45 pence, it's been shown in Ukraine. <laughs> 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 Let's go! <laughs> Very good. OK, time to meet our first virtual guest. Over 30 million streams of the recent BBC One hit The Serpent made this French actor a star here in Britain. Please welcome Taha Rahim! Hey. Hey. <laughs> it's so nice to see you smiling. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm not wooden. Uh, yeah, not the face <laughs> of a killer. Uh, where are you, where are you, Tahar? I'm in Paris. Beautiful. Yeah. And uh, we've got to begin by saying congratulations on the success of The Serpent. I mean, it was just an enormous success. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I think for an audience, like, watching it, it was so lovely to see those locations, see Thailand and India and stuff. But because of lockdown, some of those locations, that isn't where you were. Oh. <laughs> we ended up shooting in Tring. Tring, north of London. <laughs> north of London, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we were supposed to shoot Paris over there, and I was really concerned about that. I talked to the production, we got to shoot in Paris, we got to shoot in Paris. And we went in Tring, and when I saw Tring Paris, I was like, you know, I was blown away. They did a great job. Oh, Tring really. time in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> So you, don't, you don't have to take the euro far anymore. Listen to her. You're here tonight to talk about uh, the Mauritanian. It's available on Amazon Prime from this Thursday, April the first. And so this is a oh, it's a really harrowing true story. So t tell us about it and tell us who you play. Uh, the Mauritanian is the story of a young Mauritanian who's been um, captured by the American authorities after 9/11 and suspected to be the head recruiter of 9-11, and he was not. So he spent 14 years in Guantanamo without any charges against him. He's been tortured, and, uh, and yet he wrote a book while he was there. And, and this book became very famous. And the beautiful thing about Mohamedou al-Slahi 
is that he doesn't have any resentment and he roots for forgiveness and he forgive all his captors. And, and it's real. OK, let's watch a, a clip. This is you and your lawyer, played by the great uh, Jodie Foster, uh, meeting in Guantanamo. Why didn't you tell us? Or nothing. Like fantasy, yeah. None of that happened. You signed them. They made me. They made you as in they coerced you? What, what do you think? I don't know. You tell me. Did they coerce you? But you got to tell me what happened, Mahamadou. You, you, you asked me to set fire to this place, but I'm still sitting. Well, then write it down. All right, that's what the pages are for. Write it down. You need to tell me the truth. You need to tell me what happened to you. I can't defend you. Do you I, understand that? I don't that? need to tell you nothing. Whatever I say, it doesn't matter. This island, I die here. Outside, my family, my brother, they, they, their lives go on. Terry's life goes on. But me here, I'm, I'm, I'm like a statue. Wow. Uh, everyone in this movie is so good. And you mentioned uh, that you met Mahamadou, but you didn't just meet him, he came to set, which must have been so strange for him and for you. Yeah, for me, it was, it was amazing because I've been talking with him for, uh, I mean, for months. And when, he, when, when I saw him, I bumped into his arms and I felt like I was meeting someone that I haven't seen for years, like a good friend or uh, a family member. But when he came on set, the set was so well uh, recreated in details that he managed somehow to hide everything and crack jokes and all. But at some point it was too heavy for him. And the surprise is that Nancy Hollander came down there to meet him because they're very good friends. And they came that very day when Jody and I would, uh, you know, when she comes and just visits him. And they watched the scene, both of them. They took their hands and started to cry. It was very moving. Wow. And I wondered, how long does it take for you to, you know, as to Harahim sitting there, to get used to the fact that that's Jody Foster <laughs> sitting on the other side of the table? <laughs> I was, uh, I wanted to say Clarice. <laughs> 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 well, it was it was great. It was an honor to work with her. She uh, she is the coolest. She's the nicest, and uh, and what a great actress. Because because you had a similar experience, didn't you, with Daniel Day Lewis? Oh my gosh, Taha! I got to meet Daniel Day Lewis. This was like a oh, big wow. deal for me. I was doing a show on Broadway, and Daniel Day Lewis came to see the show. Like in America, a lot of them come backstage, say hi to you, and he came backstage, and he was there in my doorway of my dressing room, all tall and amazing, and he started saying to me, you know, I I, I liked what you did with the stage, and well, I liked <laughs> the way that you did this when he's very softly spoken and he's so and it's just going through you and and I was panicking standing there thinking and I'm gonna say something that I like about you like I like you in this movie I like the way you do this I like the way you work and he was wearing this fantastic woolen dark green almost like a sail like a sailor like a knit Ooh. very nice knit <laughs> and uh, anyways like I like this I like this anyway I just wanted to tell you I really enjoyed the show and I said I like your woolly jumper. <laughs> 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 and then he kind of looked at me and he said, uh, thank, thank you, and then he left. <laughs> and that's why I used my time with Daniel Day-Lewis to do, to congratulate him on his jumper. So. And apparently there is someone who makes you tongue-tied, Deborah Reedon. Yeah, there is, there is. I, I, um, I met David Atterburn and he, he's every, you know, wildlife, conservation, climate change, everything. And, uh, and the first time I met him, I mean, I literally, I, I, I went up to him. So this was voluntary. I put <laughs> myself into this situation and I, and I said, hello, I just wanted to say, and then I spoke in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went scarlet and ran away. And I think the only <laughs> words I can remember saying, I meant to say I'm not a crazy woman, but I think I said crazy woman. <laughs> <laughs> You must wonder, how on earth did she make her money? <laughs> <laughs> and Rob Brydon, you must have met all your heroes, have you? I've been lucky. I, I've, I, yeah, I've met loads of them. The, the ones that you looked at when you were in childhood, they have such a... There's a when, when television was magic and film was magic, um, to the point where, you, you mentioned um, uh, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, I had the opportunity to meet Al Pacino. 
Um, and oh. I, I was doing a film called The Huntsman with Jessica Chastain. Oh, yeah, yeah. And she said, uh, oh, Al is in London, you know, we're going to have drinks, I know you're a fan, would you, would you like to meet him? And I actually chose not to meet him. Because, here's my, here's my logic, I thought, I've already got a great relationship with Al. <laughs> <laughs> In my head. You know, I, what, what, what's the best that could happen? We're not going to become buddies. I could, I, I'll end up complimenting him on his jumper. It'll be... <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, it'll, maybe he'll speak really quietly. I just thought... <laughs> so, I, so I actually said... No, cos I had that image. Yeah. I've been going, what's this guy? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you say something smart? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there's just... There, there is a fear. It, it is a, it's a strange thing, you know. Because, the heart, were you able to kind of... You know, were you able to ask Jodie Foster about her movies and stuff, or was it just, no, we are two actors working together? Yeah. Oh, no, I didn't, you know. I was, uh, I was shy. I mean, this is Jodie Foster. I was, <laughs> I, I didn't see myself like, hey, can you tell me about this movie and that? <laughs> I, I was like, oh, no, no, man. <laughs> no. I didn't want to bother her. Uh, well, it's been lovely talking to you, Tahar. Uh, the Mauritanian mm. is on Amazon Prime from Thursday. Tahar Rahim, everybody! <laughs> Thank bonsoir. you, everyone. <laughs> bonsoir. Merci, bonsoir. Uh, listen, uh, Kush Jumbo brings yes. us a tense new drama serial. It's called The Beast Must Die. It's available on BritBox from the 27th of May. And I think I'm right in saying this is the, the first original drama on BritBox. Yes, it's the first. It's exclusively... Britbox's first original piece of drama, yeah. OK, so The Beast Must Die, uh, tell us about it. Who are you? OK, so The Beast Must Die is a very dark revenge thriller about a woman, a young mother called Frances, who has just lost her very young son and kind of goes on, I guess, a revenge mission to infiltrate the family of the man that she believes murdered her son. Wow. Yeah. And it's a great cast, not just Kush Jumbo. I mean, you'd show up for Kush Jumbo, but there's you'd other show people up in for it. Kush, yeah, you would. there's other people in it. You would. Jared Harris, Billy Howell, yeah. um, Geraldine James. It's a brilliant, yeah. really brilliant cast, yeah. Well, we've got a clip. This is the very beginning, which is, it's such a strong opening. Here we go. <laughs> I'm gonna get... I'm getting... I am going to kill a man. I don't know his name. I don't know where he lives. I have no idea what he looks like. But I'm going to find him. And kill him. Ooh. It's good, isn't it? You're very versatile, aren't you? I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have said that was you. I was like, that's not you. <laughs> you're, you're, you're one of those proper actors, aren't you? <laughs> a, a virtual chameleon. Heck. And, Kush, we mentioned there how you found your success in, the, in, in America and with the, uh, Josephine and I, and then you got The Good Wife. I and love then, it. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, it's been you. an eye. You know, the thing you inspire. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yes, the, yes, the, the, yes. The, the, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you know that thing you did years ago? <laughs> yeah, when, I, when, yeah, when <laughs> she was at school. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> can, I, can I thank you quietly, like Daniel Day-Lewis did? <laughs> <laughs> <That's very much>. <laughs> 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 we did your one-woman show. That led to uh, The Good Wife, The Good Fight. Yeah. But theatre, for you, does play a part in your romantic life. Well, without, without planning it, it has been... It has been attached to some big life events for me. I got married in a theatre cos I was doing this show on Broadway with Hugh Jackman. It was a three-hander, a Jez Butterworth play. Oh, there it is. It's a Jez Butterworth play called The River. And um, my husband and I, we got married after the matinee on stage. Not, like, on stage, like, the audience weren't there. It wasn't like, <laughs> would you all like to stay? No. Um, yeah, we got married after the show and the crew were... And is this, is this right after your wedding in Times Square? Yes, oh. that is. We went walking around Times Square um, with a photographer, yeah. And then you just went back and did the evening show? No, well, it was a Sunday, so there was only oh, one show. So, okay. no, we, we, were, we were drunk by then. But, yeah. So, <laughs> but, no, yeah, that, that was our wedding, and Hugh was actually our witness. And then, not to be too indelicate, but your, your son has a close connection to the theatre. My son was conceived in a theatre <laughs> between... <laughs> 
<laughs> between the matinee and the evening show at the That's National. a busy time for you. Well, it's a short... <laughs> what happened was my husband brought me a, a, a sandwich, a pret, and then it was very... It was a quick lunch. I don't know. How, how, I, could, I, you, <laughs> how could you say no? <laughs> yeah, it just happened. It's just happening. I guess I'll I guess I'll die on stage. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but but you are actually going to do some old-fashioned acting yes. in, a, in a theater. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, I was supposed to do Hamlet as soon as I came back at the Young Vic and we were shut down. So now a whole year later, um, this year we will be doing it. September 25th we open Hamlet at the Young Vic. There it is. I'm so excited to finally do it. So well. yeah. And, I mean, Rob, you had a similar experience in that this time last year, your tour was all set to, to go. Yeah, so you find yourself in these dramatic situations that, that you just never thought you'd experience. I, I was touring, I finally put together a musical show with a nine-piece band. We were touring Britain, uh, sort of stories and, and, and songs. And we were loving it. We were in Guildford, 12 shows in. Now, the... It had started, the pandemic had started. It's just over a year ago now. Yeah. And we were actually on stage in Guildford doing the sound check in the afternoon when the Prime Minister did that press conference where he said, I'm not going to say you can't go to the theatre, <laughs> I'm going to say you shouldn't. But I'm not going to say you can't. So, thanks. <laughs> so, <laughs> I had to make that decision and the promoter was there and the head of the theatre was at the G Live in Guildford and I said, well, I... I can't do the show tonight. I can't say, come and see me, and then someone gets ill. So the musicians all set up on the stage. I almost cried yeah. because it was the most unusual thing to have to do. I had to go and say, look, I'm sorry, guys, but we're not going to do the show. And that was it, and, and the rest of the tour didn't happen. Yeah. So we've lived through these just, as you had yeah. pushed, these, these incredible times. But the good news is you are back. Uh, That's the news that I think is going to lift the nation's yeah. spirits. Yeah. Come on, who doesn't want a night of songs and laughter? Yeah. Never, yeah. Mind, that man. never mind the vaccine push. <laughs> Rob Brydon is doing a show with a band. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Woohoo! No, it is. No, it is. It's a. Per it sounds like the perfect show. It opens in Eastbourne on the 10th of September uh, through to January. There are two nights at the London Palladium. The London Palladium. The London Palladium. Seventh. Uh, 13th and the 18th of November. And the thing is, I knew you you could sing. I knew you'd a lovely voice. I didn't know it was as good as this. Here's a clip of what to expect in A Night of Songs and Laughter. I dreamed last night I got on the boat to heaven And by some chance I had brought my dice along And there I stood and I hollered, someone feed me. But the passengers, they knew right from wrong. For the people all said, sit down, sit down, you're rocking the boat. The people all said, sit down, sit down, you're rocking the boat. And the devil will drag you under by the shop of hell and your checkered coat. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, you're rocking the boat. Do you, will you have to... How long will you get to re-rehearse the show before you...? Well, we'll probably rehearse with my musical director prior to getting the band together. Right. A couple of weeks. And I know every person says about their band, but, my God, those people, they're so good. Yeah. They are incredible musicians. And, you know, when we did the earlier leg of it, I could tell the shock in the audience. They thought, oh, Rob Brighton's doing a show. It'll be, it'll be fine. But then they saw that band and they just blow you away. And are the band good at laughing at your stories every night? It's contractual. <laughs> <laughs> We've had to lose a few, Graham, who didn't laugh. That's the third lot I've been through. Because no, that is hard for a band. But that's the great thing, from my point of view, who's used to doing stand-up tours, which are great because you get all the money, Nonetheless, <laughs> because I didn't know you have to pay the band. But oh. on this, the great thing is you've got a little family. So we come off at the end of the first half and swap notes on how it went and you, you just get that feedback. And um, it was one of the most enjoyable things I'd done. And it's just a happy show, you know. Yeah. I, think, I think that's what people want. 
Well, uh, Deborah Reedon, I'm not singing, but dancing on Strictly a few years ago. Oh, look at you. Oh, look at me. There yes. you are. <laughs> and, I mean, were you passionate about dancing beforehand or did this suddenly wake up this thing in you? Uh, no, I mean, I've always liked music, so I've always liked dancing, but, I mean, doing Strictly is a way different thing to dancing a bit at weddings. So, um, <laughs> the lovely thing is, I, he, my husband... I, when I was doing Strictly, Paul could see how much I loved... I mean, loved... I was... I loved doing Strictly. And he secretly took dancing lessons. Oh, I know, I that's know, the, I know. That, that's and I've the been most so romantic mean to him thing. for thirty years. I've been horrible to him for thirty years, and then he goes and does that. <laughs> and um, and and as a result of that, um, he grew to love dancing. We both loved dancing. He went off to Buenos Aires, learnt how to do Argentine tango. Um, and we now dance probably about four hours a week oh, whenever wow. we can. Mm. So, yeah. yeah we'll draw a veil. We'll draw a veil there, shall we? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, they dance for four hours a week. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's a lovely thing, though, because we, we have busy lives. We all have busy lives. And actually, just being face to face with your partner, you know, but there's four hours of yes, five we, weeks. We hear you, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> four hours. Four hours, four hours face you've to face. Got you've got sweating. Got <laughs> sweating. <laughs> <laughs> the rhythm. <laughs> oh, dear. Right, time for our second virtual chat tonight. This father and son acting duo have teamed up to bring us the moving drama Made in Italy. Please say hello to Liam Neeson and Michal Richardson. <laughs> Woo! Hey! Hello! Hello. Uh, hello. There's been debate, yeah. debate all afternoon. Uh, Liam, we know is Liam. Are you Michael or Michal? It's Mihal. Mihal. Yes. Okay. It's decided. It's decided. And where are you guys tonight? Uh, New York, Graham. Oh, New York, baby. I'm getting ready to ship out to Bulgaria in a few days' time to shoot another bang bang shoot 'em up movie. So. Well, do you know what? I knew nothing about this movie uh, made in Italy, and I was the I so I just thought. Oh, Thanks a lot. No, 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 <laughs> no. But I thought it. No, but I thought it was going to be a bang bang shoot 'em up thing. <laughs> And it's so not. It's such a special, special movie. It's called Made in Italy. It's on Amazon Prime from today. And in the movie, you play father and son. Uh, tell us about it. Yeah, it's about a father and son who've kind of split apart. They've, I've lost my wife. He's lost his mother, uh, tragically, which we can very much relate to. And um, and we, 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 he has to... We have to sell this house in Tuscany that belonged to my wife and um, because he needs money. Um, to buy back my art gallery. In London. Yeah. Yes. And uh, in the process of selling this dilapidated house, we, we form a, a close bond again. And I don't think I've ever seen this before, where you've got two actors kind of portraying an experience that mirrors their own lives so closely, because of you, you, you lost your mother, you lost your wife uh, when Natasha Richardson died. Was it 2009? So, but this wasn't written for you. No, no, it was written by James Darcy, who's a wonderful British actor, first-time director, uh, who went through uh, a similar emotional experience when he was younger. Sent me the script. I remember reading it and thinking, oh, my gosh, this is a bit near the knuckle. Um, I felt a churning in my gut, and uh, but I thought, gosh, it would be great to do this, and it would be great to do it with my son. He's a little bit too young for it, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and me all, do the two of you kind of sit down and have that conversation, of kind of going, are we comfortable with playing these emotions out in public? Yeah, we did. We had a conversation over the phone, and like, just so odd how it came and it was 10 years after mom had passed and that year also we had to sell an old family home where she grew up and I grew up um so it kind of hit a little extra harder for us you know and as you say it is a very emotional film but it's also romantic and it's funny and it's sure. also stunning it's such a beautiful film uh, let's take a look at a clip is the views quite good that's what you're calling one of the most spectacular convergences of nature ever. A view. We haven't even looked at it. 
Two cypress trees frame the composition, subconsciously propelling the eye across the negative space toward the focal point of the perfectly central villa, all unified by these magnificent undulating Tuscan hills. Late afternoon, remember? The way the light hits those windows, takes your breath away. No, that's the dust doing that. I mean, how could you let it go like this? Oh, an interruption. What a shame. Must be the state agent. Damn, she's early. <laughs> and it is what an amazing place to film. Uh, but is it true, Michal, they made you audition to play Liam's son? Yeah. <laughs> kind of. I, I felt like for my own dignity, it, it was good that I auditioned for the director and not just have it be like, yeah, I want my son to play this and that's that. So. What was that, cool pursuit? No, 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 that was for this one. Well, that's you, you, aud you yeah. auditioned? Yeah. I did the James, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we're talking now. Um... <laughs> Can I ask a question, Michal? Having worked at a family business, how is it working at a family business? <laughs> Woo! You know, it's actually all right. I mean, honestly, it was kind of traumatizing at the age of five seeing your dad get sliced in half by a lightsaber. <laughs> or blown up in some crazy factory explosion and also kissing somebody else. Um, that I always thought that was like CGI as a kid. <laughs> I didn't I thought it was some like weird Hollywood effect. It wasn't real until I came the age. I was like, oh wait, yeah, that's actually part of the profession. <laughs> <laughs> that's really did you take me all to set, Liam? Yes. I have to tell uh, no, go ahead. Go on. Uh, one little funny story I remember I was, I was making Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, and Leavesden, Leavesden Studios about 23 years ago. And uh, it was at lunchtime, and I was, Michael was two. So I was carrying him, uh, showing him the set at lunchtime, and R2D2 was parked up against wherever. And um, I was carrying Michael Brown and pointing things out, and he saw R2-D2. Now, he knew nothing about Star Wars or saw any movies or comics or anything like that. He's two. But he saw this little metallic creature, and he was like this. <laughs> Had to get down from my arms, waddled over to this thing and started hugging it, which I thought was fascinating. <laughs> and I remember after lunch, I told George Lucas, I said, George, I brought my son to see, uh, you know... He, he, he had to go down and go over to, to R2-D2 and uh, just hug him. And George wasn't surprised. He had a smile on his face and he says, yeah, he has that effect on, on children. Aww. I says, but my kid is two years of age. And, uh, you know, it's a big chunk of metal. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he, just, he just knew it was cuddly and comfortable and friendly, you know? Is this what it's like, Michal, when you bring dates home? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, it's, he's got the lightsaber out. He's, uh, yeah. Now I'm going, hi. Have you seen Taken 1, 2, and 3 by any chance? What about you? Have you seen The Phantom Menace? Okay, I'll leave you guys. I'll go. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, Mihal, you mentioned the lightsaber. Do you, have, do you have any Star Wars stuff in your house? There is, there is the Holy Grail, which I think, um, Oh, yeah. oh, oh. Well, I've got, tonight. This piece of wood <laughs> has, has been to the planet Tatooine and back many, many times. Wow. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm terribly sorry. Oh. oh. The film was going to be called The Beginning, it says it here. And anyway, this is the one I had in, in the film. And all the, all the Star Wars fans all think, well, you turn on the the lightsaber with your mind. He says, no, there's a red button. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. What to do with the mind? Anyway. Uh, listen, guys, it's been lovely to talk to you. Uh, Made in Italy is out now. The very best of luck with it. It's a beautiful film. Liam Neeson and Michal Richardson, everybody. <laughs> hey. Thanks, Thank you. Bye-bye. Graham.
Ben, can I can I just say something? Um, <laughs> there's an elephant in the room. Oh God! You very clearly <laughs> asked Mihal if he wanted to be called Mihal or yeah. Michael. Yes. He very uh, clearly <laughs> said Mihal. Uh -huh. That's what I thought. And yet his father. <laughs> yes. I, yes. I, yes. I wasn't going to bring that up. I felt. I felt. <laughs> I thought there were some issues there. <laughs> I will, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, I have a particular set of skills. I will hunt for you. I will find you. And when I do, I will call you Michael. <laughs> it, it, was, it was odd. Uh, well, now, uh, before we hear tonight's music performance, I am looking for a volunteer to sit in the red chair, please. Oh, all right, then. Go on. If you insist. <laughs> it's fine. The people have done it. It's not as bad as it looks. You'll uh, be, you'll I'm be happy fine. to do it, Graham. You're great. Tonight? Yes. Oh. <laughs> no, you know, sit. Sit, sit, sit. sit. Enjoy the music. Relax. Enjoy the music. Red Cheryl, wait. Uh, right, it is time for music. After five years away, this award-winning singer-songwriter is back with a bang, performing her latest single, Church Girl. Please welcome Laura Mvula. <laughs>
Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I can't help you off, I'm sorry. Okay, it's fine. Uh, there's a nice clean chair and a drink waiting thank for you. you. Uh, thank you so much for that performance. Thank you so oh. much for having me back. It's, well, it's so nice to see you again. After 500 years. <laughs> well, no, because I have to say, so that, that single's out now, right? It is yeah, now. Yeah, so that's out right now. Uh, so the last time you were here, <laughs> I was encouraging you to come out with another album. <laughs> How long ago was that? Let's say five to six years ago. Okay, let's go to five to six years, yeah. But the good news is there is a new album now. Finally. Uh, where is it? Oh, here we go. Look uh, at her. Laura Mvula. Pink Noise, everybody. Please. Pink Noise. Woo! Yeah. So we waited five or six years. When are you bringing this out? This is in July. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say that's really soon. It's not soon. No, oh, okay. no, oh. now would be soon. <laughs> yeah. I know, it's the 2nd of July, I think. This is true. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 2nd of July, good things come to those who... And wait. also, it's got to be... I bet if it's, all, if it's like that, what a great summer record and... yeah. It's definitely a summer record. Yeah. It's um, 80s vibe. We just said we felt like we just had our first night we, out. We, I, brilliant. Me and Deborah, <laughs> we went out, out. <laughs> we did, like, we were. We were there. Really <laughs> like, we were really <laughs> like. I was yeah. like, Deborah, we're out, we're out, out. <laughs> um, yes, I will be on tour in September. Oh, what? fantastic! Yes. Yay. Yes. Oh, brilliant. Well, listen. Thank you so much for that gorgeous performance. Thank you. Uh, good luck with the single, the album, and everything else. And welcome back to the world, Laura Mbula. <laughs> Nearly it, but before we go, just time for a visit to the big red chair. Rob Bryden, he's been strapped in. There Why? he is. Why not Deborah? I don't understand. <laughs> 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 It's recycling night at our house. I need it at home. Uh, OK, let's meet the first person up to, who's going to be telling a story to keep you in that chair. Hi. OK, thank you, yeah. OK, are you on the other line? <laughs> Hello, Graham. Hello. What? <laughs> Is it Jackie Weaver? <laughs> <laughs> Does she have no authority? <laughs> uh, now, uh, what's your name? What's your name? My name's Gail. Gail, lovely. And what have you won lots of prizes for, Gail? Oh, it's not me. It's my, my youngest son. He's, he used to play football and do cross country. He's very good, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, OK, Gail, off you go with your story. OK, so just to set the scene, we're talking 25, maybe 26 years ago, when my youngest son was in reception school and they were starting to learn how to spell some words. So the teacher was making it quite easy by going through the alphabet and doing very small words. And they get to W, and as you know, there's not very many <laughs> small words with W that you can spell. So after a couple of words, she says, OK, we'll make it a little bit harder and we'll put another letter with the W. And she said, well, huh. So my son, hand up straight away. Miss, 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 I've got a word. She'd go on and Andrew, what is it? Whip. Oh, she just very good. That's a nice word, yes. My mum's got a whip. Oh, why she, Andrew? <laughs> OK. Yes, it's upstairs in the bedroom. She'd OK, Andrew, that's fine. <laughs> she has some handcuffs as well. So when they come out and told me, I said to him, did you ask him, though, what the whip was and what the handcuffs were? She says, no, I didn't go there. So I said, we do have a whip. I said, but it was... Somebody bought it us in the 80s. they have been to a bullfight in Spain and it was one of them cheap, tacky souvenir things that they bought back. And then the handcuffs were some proper handcuffs, but they'd lost the keys for them. And my eldest, Philip, got stuck in them. So to make sure they didn't get stuck in them again, I threw them on top of the wardrobe and that was why they were up there. It was really, really innocent at the end of the day. I'll let you walk, I'll let you walk. There you go. go oh, on. thank you. No, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't flip, flip you for Gail. Did anyone else think the word beginning with W was going to be wank? Yes! <laughs> I, <thought that> was... <laughs> no, I was so surprised when we got to whip. I was like, oh, oh, oh. She asked for a long word, so I thought it was going to be... I can't even say it. Uh. That's what uh, I thought. Oh, yeah, wanker. Oh, wanker. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Never can't say that. Rob, you survived the chair. You survived the chair. Can't we just tip him out the chair anyway? What? Can't we just tip him out for calling me Deb? Oh, OK, Debbie, OK, like. we're yes. going. OK, here we go. Here we go. Oh, and... Wow. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> you loved it, really. And that is really all we've got time for. If you'd like to have a go in the red chair yourself and tell your story, you can contact us via website at this very address. And please say a huge thank you to all of my guests tonight. Laura Mvula! <laughs> Jahar Rahim! <laughs> Rob Bryden! He's alive! <laughs> Chris Jumbo! Deborah Needham! And Miho 
Carl Richardson and Liam Neeson. Join me next week with music from Steps with Michelle Visage, Frank Skinner, uh, Melissa McCarthy, Octavia Spencer, Nick Mohammed, and David Trimmer. I'll see you then. Good night, everybody. Bye bye. Stand up legends and the best new comedy talent in a festival of funny. Press red to watch now on iPlayer. With song and love in their hearts, Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling. Toe tap onto your telly here next on BBC One in La La Land.